Joseph Finder is a New York Times bestselling author of 16 novels. He writes both standalones and the Nick Heller series. His novels have been made into movies. They have won two Barry Awards, one Thriller Award, and one Strand Critic Award. Um, and Joel is a very sharp guy, a graduate of Yale and the Harvard Russian Research Center. I've had the pleasure of knowing Joe for many years. And Joe, I'd love to welcome you to Thriller Talk. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We're going to have some fun today. So Joe and Ryan, this is an auspicious occasion. This is the first time you're actually meeting. And you may not know this, but you have something interesting in common. Joe is from a family of five, and Ryan has six kids. So you know about big families. Yep. Joe, Excellent. a lot of your books are based on family dynamics. Can you share an example where your real life experience worked its way somehow into a novel? Oh, my real life experience? Yeah. Um, every book I write is informed by what my real life experience is like. Um, you know, I grew up, I spent my early childhood in Afghanistan and the Philippines. So I lived in foreign countries and I sort of, that is what immediately got me into writing international thrillers for the first several books in my career, was the international stuff. Um, and you know, I also write in my most recent book, House on Fire, it's really based on a family. And uh, it's based in some ways distantly on my own family. I sort of think back to the sibling rivalry dynamics, what the brothers, the, the brother relationship is like, what the brother sister relationship is like, and uh, that sort of, that sort of, that was what made me want to write the book. Really, was growing up in a family of five kids, you know. So it's just super dynamic. I actually didn't know that about your background living in, in Afghanistan. And yeah, um, I was. My also brother was born in Afghanistan. My sister was born in Afghanistan. Yeah. Wow. Have you gone back there? Haven't. Yeah. Haven't, and don't want to now. No, that's what I was thinking. Right. It was a great country. I mean, it really shaped my family in lots of ways. And uh, uh, I sort of miss the idea of living in a foreign country when you're a kid. I mean, I learned, the first language I learned before I learned English was, was Farsi. Mm -hmm. Wow. As, a little, as a little kid, because that was what the, the household helpers were speaking to me. And um, my parents were concerned that I wouldn't learn to speak English, <laughs> in fact. So, but I did eventually. Well, Joe, uh, a long time fan of your work, man. I've always thought that your I, books are, are really cinematic. Um, so what was it like then, I wonder, to see your novels adapted for the big screen? And what was your involvement in those films? Yeah, it's very different. I had, I had two books adapted into movies and one adapted into a TV pilot and um, a, a number of other ones in the works. So um, when I, when the book High Crimes was made into the movie High Crimes with Morgan Freeman and Ashley Judd, um, I, I, they invited me to be on the set and I remember sitting there on the set thinking how cool this was that the scene that I described, that I made up in my head, sitting alone in front of my computer, was now a, a, a movie set with all these painters and artists making it feel real and the, the props and the makeup and that kind of thing. It's like, it's amazing if you think about it that what took one person sitting in, alone in a room took probably 500 people to put together. So that's kind of amazing. It sort of makes me glad that I'm only writing novels <laughs> because it's sort of, it's a kind of a, the power of imagination is greater, I think, when you're, when you're a novelist. That's one of the things I really love about doing it. Um, I, I was in High Crimes, so I, 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 I played a JAG officer, and um, I asked them 
what you know what's what should I be doing? I mean, I have I had no lines. What should I do? And they told me my job was to glare at Morgan Freeman and look menacing. <laughs> and my character beats Morgan Freeman up, in fact, uh, in one of the scenes in the movie. Not me, but my character they had his son man do it. Um, and uh, it was different when I when when high crime when paranoia was made into a movie. Um, that was the set was on, in Philadelphia. It was filmed on location there. They used Philadelphia to stand in for New York, and I was not offered the role as an extra. So it was sort of outside. I was observing it from the outside, and but to see, you know, Gary Oldman and Harrison Ford reading these lines and sort of going after each other was kind of amazing. I mean, I sort of thought that was really good casting. So I don't know if, if I'm telling you anything useful, but it was really cool to see it. I'm not one of these writers who basically grouses about the movies that have been made from the books. I mean, you know, once we sell the rights, that's it. Uh, Hollywood is going to do what they want to do with it. And all I hoped in both cases was that the movies turn out good as movies. Mm -hmm. I didn't care if they were exactly like my books. There are all kinds of things you, I would cut out if I were adapting one of my books into the movies. Um, but the part, the thing that we novelists can do that screenwriters and actors can't do is we can't show you what's in the character's head. So, I really take advantage of that in my thrillers, showing us you're in the character's head, mm -hmm. the excitement of that, um, which is something which you know actors can try to portray, but they they're limited. Only we novelists can say what really is inside the character's head. So there are all kinds of differences between writing a novel and having it appear on screen. Um, End of the day, my feeling is that all I care about is the movie's good because it's kind of like a billboard for the book. It brought me, you know, the, the movie High Crime has brought me a lot more readers, made me a bestseller, in fact. So, you know, it was a great thing, no matter how different it was from the original book. Well, both are both are great movies, by the way, and you have a lot of star power in those. Like, holy, yeah. holy cow, man, you got a lot of, a lot of A-listers in both of those movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I had a picture of Morgan Freeman on my wall when I was writing High Crimes. Oh, wow. Because his that was the voice I had for the character of Charlie Grimes. And then when they told me they actually cast him to play the Charlie Grimes character, I was kind of stunned. That was really perfect. Ashley Judd was great. It was a great piece of casting to have her as this sort of high-powered lawyer whose husband turns out to be something she didn't know. Uh, and yeah, Her not just Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman in Paranoia, but Liam Hemsworth, one of the Hemsworth brothers, mm -hmm. is sort of the star, Adam. And, you know, it's been great to have those kind of stars. I actually, uh, when I arrived on the set for Paranoia, um, I said, I, I was in the elevator with Liam Hemsworth, hadn't met him. And I said, Adam Cassidy. And he said, uh, no, I'm actually Liam Hemsworth. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> Adam was the name of the character. I was kind of riffing. Right? <laughs> That's funny. I love it. That's great. So we touched on House of Fire a little earlier. Um, you went in depth into the world of opioid overuse. Yeah. And as a former medical writer, actually, I find this you know, very interesting that you're following it as well. Um, what, with your research, what was a surprising thing you discovered? What I discovered, and I talked to, you know, the, the, the story is about a pharmaceutical titan, a very rich man and his family, who have gotten really rich off of opioids. And I talked to people in the pharmaceutical business, 
some of whom would not let me use their names, but they wanted to talk anyway. And what I discovered that surprised me was how active uh, these pharmaceutical companies are in selling the drug to doctors. I mean, they fly them down to these sales conferences and wine and dine them and, and give them talks about how if you're getting rid of pain, this is, this is the best thing you can do as a doctor is to alleviate pain. And they actually, some of these companies lied to the doctors and said these are not addictive drugs, for example. Um, I was kind of amazed at how dishonest some of these pharmaceutical companies could be and get away with it. And I heard that and I just sort of thought, now that makes a good scene, you know? I mean, because that's what I'm concerned about is what's exciting to the reader. Not necessarily, I mean, you know, it's not a documentary. It's not a nonfiction book. I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm trying to sort of make it feel real and exciting to the reader. And my understanding is you had a friend who's a doctor help you with the acid reflux clinical trial. Yeah, Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Because that absolutely fascinated me. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a scene in which Nick Heller, my hero, uh, uh, decides to have undergo one of these medical trials in order to get into a company. And I didn't know what kind of trial to make him go through. And uh, so I talked to someone who designed, I said, let's do acid reflux. And I talked to a scientist. And I said, if you were designing a medical study, exactly how would it work? What would happen to the guy who's going through the study? And he told me about this, you know, they would make him swallow this kind of probe and, and um, give him certain drugs that would cause acid reflux and sort of test how long, how acidic it was and test how long this was. Anyway, he designed the experiment for me. So the way it appears in the book is the way it really would have happened. You know, and I was, I'm always amazed at how willing experts are talk to novelists, you know? It's really interesting. They, people are kind of fascinated by the process in which a novel is created. And this, th that scientist I talked to was really fascinated that I wanted to get the details right, you know? Um, but I sort of, my feeling is I wanted that guy to read House on Fire and say, he got it right. You know, even though 99% of my readers wouldn't know that, that's all right. Well, I'm going to say I'll take a hard pass on that clinical trial, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I was going to say, you're fascinated that people will talk about it. I'm fascinated people sign up for this. I know. Um, seriously, well, you get paid. Okay. And there are people, I talk, to some, I talk <laughs> to some people who get basically who make their living doing clinical trials all year round. To sort of move from, from company to company around the country and do and take stuff and and I, I, I could never do that. No, no thanks. Uh, <laughs> I'll just keep it's talking about it. thrillers with, with Kim. Uh, <laughs> and anyone who follows you on social media knows uh, you have a love for a certain type of pencil. So how did this start? And, and what is it that you enjoy about working by hand uh, in this digital age? Yeah. So. I actually, when I write, I write um, on the computer uh, and I wouldn't do it any other way. But when I edit, I do it with a pencil. So this is from, these are my black wings. These are these great pencils with really soft lead and good erasers. And um, I discovered them when I was a grad student and I started, I, I, that you go through them fast because they're so soft. Um, then one day I went to the stationery store to buy, buy more black wings and they said, sorry, it's been discontinued. And I freaked out. So what I did was I called up 
all these stationary wholesalers around the country and bought up as many black wings as I could. And then come to find out that I'm not the only writer that loved black wing pencils. You know, John Steinbeck, um, Broadway writers that I've talked to uh, all love the black wing pencil. And there's something kind of sensuous about using a pencil on a typescript. You know, I, I scratch things out, I write things in, I sort of do it. I'm using a different part of my brain when I edit. So that's why I use a pencil. And, and it's sort of, um, I always edit my drafts. I sort of write what's usually called a shitty draft. That's what I do. And then I take a pencil and fix it. And then I input the changes, you know, into the computer. So you don't actually write out your first draft by hand like uh, right. Nelson DeMille and Daniel Silva because my hand cramps talking to them about it. I know, like, I, know, I, know and, I know. And and all you writers, by the way, everyone has a different um, uh, favorite pencil, like a different flavor that they prefer better. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, yeah. No. I I mean, when I my writing career began um, when there were no computers, there were. The, the, the coolest thing to use was the IBM Selectric typewriter. So I wrote my first novel on an IBM Selectric. Wow. And then computers came out. And as soon as I could get one, I said, I'm not going back. Because this is, you could do draft after draft after draft and not have to re-enter it and not have to retype it. So those, and there are, there are writers who use pencils. There are writers I know who use typewriters. I'm talking manual typewriters. My fingers aren't strong enough for that. No, that's commitment, honestly. That's Isn't it? that's a commitment right there. I, yeah. I, I could not do that either. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it's a waste of time. I mean, I just sort of feel you can write a lot faster. Uh, and when I edit, the, the slogan of Blackwing Pencils is half the pressure, twice the speed, which I think is, okay. is, is what else should kind of thriller writer want. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. That's great. Um, so, Joe, I love all of your books. <clears throat> well, I have to say I have a special affinity for power play, um, probably because it involves a hostage taking. <laughs> That's my thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I wanted to say, like, there, the, the magic of that with the closed door situation in a way. Um, also, you know, <clears throat> ordinary person thrust into extraordinary circumstances. Can you dive into the process that you used writing that book and, and how that story developed? Yeah, so I was, um, when I was doing research for Paranoia, I talked to a lot of people at the top of corporations to sort of get a sense of how a CEO operates and what it's like to fire people and what it's like to be fired yourself and all this kind of thing. So one of the CEOs I talked to talked about how he had just come back from this retreat uh, that was in British Columbia and um, there was no internet, no Wi-Fi, no cell phone signals, no phone service, nothing. And I thought to myself, this is such a scene for a thriller. And as soon as I heard that, the, the story exploded in my head. I was going to have the top executives of this big aerospace firm fly to this, this offsite where they're cut off from the rest of the world. And one of them is a ringer. One of them is a guy who is not a CEO, CFO, not a C-level exec at all, but just a regular guy who happens to be put there. And uh, then they're taken over by, by sort of mysterious guys from the woods who come in and take them over, hold them for ransom, for the largest ransom ever demanded. And the story almost wrote itself. It's funny. Um, I wrote that book in probably three months. I've never written a book as quickly as that. And it was just really alive in my head uh, and really exciting to write. And I sort of feel that, I mean, it's great to hear that you like, that you found the book exciting. 
the writing process was exciting. And one of the things I got to do was to talk to people in the K&R business, kidnapping and ransom business, hostage, hostage rescue people, to talk about what they would do in this situation, how they would handle it. And I got some great details in there, which you know, which are you've written about in your books. Um, you sort of know how interesting that business is, right? Very so, much. Yeah, yeah. So I really, I loved writing that book. Yeah, well, it, 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 the, the, the books like literally resonates in my mind today. Which you know, like when you read a lot and you look back and you see that you know there's certain books that just stand out in your mind, you know that there's something special about them. Well, thanks. I mean, it's sort of, I've written 16 books. They're all different. Um, they're not, I, I guess the Nick Heller books are the most alike, but I generally tend to write to sort of shake things up with each book, sort of come at it from a different angle because I want to keep it fresh to me. So every book that I write is a challenge and is exciting to me. Well, we're gonna. I'm gonna get to my favorite of your books in, in a minute, but I want to ask you first. Um, y you've written obviously a lot of standalones, and then you have the Nick Heller series. Which yeah. is harder to write, and why? I think the standalones are harder to write. The Nick Heller series is great because I already know the character. I've already. I already know his biography. I have sort of before I started writing the first Nick Heller novel vanished, um, I delved into the biography of Nick Keller and I created the sort of Bible, which I still refer to, you know, in book number four. Uh, so the character, the family of characters around Nick, um, they remain the same. So I don't have to invent new characters. I can sort of take these people who are, to me, old friends. So uh, and a Nick Heller story has to proceed a certain way. I mean, he's brought in for some reason into a case. He investigates. He gets beat up. You know, he digs. He usually, usually involves uncovering bad things done by very powerful people. And Nick is, is a guy who grew up rich and then was poor. And he's sort of seen both worlds. So he's kind of cynical about the world of wealth. And yet he fits very naturally in it. So anyway, Nick Heller books, I think, are generally easier for me to write. You, you might ask, why not do just Nick Heller books? And that's a legitimate question. Um, I guess it's because I'm not in it to write the easiest book necessarily. I'm in it to write whatever book grabs my imagination that year. I get an idea. Some ideas are Nick Heller ideas and some ideas cannot work for Nick Heller books. And the stories are really different. In a Nick Heller book, the series book, we know that Nick's, Nick is not going to die. He has to come back with each book. We know that. And Nick has to be an investigator. That's his role. Uh, in the standalones, I can take a main character, take a protagonist, and turn his or her life upside down. I can do stuff with my characters in a standalone I can't do in a Nick Heller book. So the stories are different. So I yeah. guess basically, you know, there are some books just shake out as Nick Heller books and some aren't. Sounds like the variety keeps things interesting too. I mean, I, I see a lot of authors these days, like Michael Connolly and others, they do, you know, a series and then they'll go to a standalone and kind of go back and forth. And I think yeah. it's a healthy way to do it because if you constantly wrote about one character every yeah. single year, I think it would really be stressful. I think so, yeah. And, you know, my fear is that I would write a book and I'd start to do it by autopilot, you know? Because, all right, so we've got Nick Heller here, and he's going to be brought in by this guy, and he's going to investigate this crime. And, and I don't want to be that guy. I, I want to be someone who 
who enjoys the writing of the book and finds it challenging. Because I think that's the way to make it more exciting for the reader. I don't want to rehash the same thing over and over again. We're grateful. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> not, but I do it for selfish reasons. No. You know? I do it because I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. I don't want to be a boring writer. I want to sort of, I want each book to sort of feel like I came at it from a different way. That there's something fresh about it, yeah, See, ideally. It goes back to the old adage of uh, if you enjoy writing it, they will enjoy reading it. And we enjoy yeah. reading it. So yeah. it's working. Yeah, and when a book, you know, there are scenes that are really exciting to write and my heart is beating, my adrenaline is pumping, I'm sweating, you know, on the keys. Uh, there are scenes that when I write them that way, they read that way. There are scenes where it's maybe two people talking and it's really tense. It feels that way when I'm writing it, you know? It's sort of the process of writing is the process of creating this feeling in the reader. And you can only do that if you're feeling it as a writer. Well said. Um, a lot of your books, you know, kind of are around conspiracy theories. Are there any conspiracy theories you see in the news today that you'd like to write about? Yeah, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Um, Public areas of the world, or or subject like anything you can give us, or I don't want to steal your idea, like and you know take it out. So, um, no, I don't. I get really protective of, of the ideas at the beginning, and it's not actually that I'm afraid that someone's going to steal it, because the truth is, if Dan Silva were to steal one of my ideas, he'd write a different kind of book. Or Nelson DeMille would write, very, he's, they'd write very different kinds of books. Uh, I'm not afraid of that. It's that if I talk about it too much before I've started to write it, it's like the air goes out of the balloon. It's less exciting for me. So I try to sort of protect the ideas, not talk about them as much as possible. Maybe I'll talk about my ideas with my agent. That's it. Otherwise, I sort of, I don't even tell my wife what I'm Okay, because I want to ask you about a different one of your books. So, uh, so one of my all-time favorite thrillers, Guilty Minds. Nice. Um, I think it's your best book. I still do. Uh, perhaps, by the way, more timely today than when it even first came out uh, these last couple of years here. Um, and it's one of the best books I've ever covered, man. So uh, can we just talk about that one for a second? Um, how did you come up with a story idea? But also, I've always wondered this. How did you choose or how did you know that was a Nick Heller book and not a standalone? Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in what was going on in the internet world, the internet world of journalism and gossip. And there was a website that I think, I think they're out of business, I'm not sure, called Gawker. And Gawker used to print gossip. Mm -hmm. And it, it had a lot of readers, and it was, became very powerful. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know I, have a, I have editor friends who told me they were afraid, they were afraid that Gawker, was, Gawker might write something about them or about their firm. And I just sort of thought, this is interesting that something based on gossip could be that powerful. And it reminded me of the old newspaper columnists from, you know, back in the 1950s when there were gossip columnists who were also really powerful. They could destroy careers by, by you know. And so anyway, I thought, I started thinking about that and how that could work as a story. And I thought, let's juxtapose this trashy gossip website with this person of great dignity and gravitas, a Supreme Court justice, mm -hmm. and how a story about this Supreme Court justice is about to come out. And if it's published, it will ruin this guy's career. So that in itself, I, I sort of thought, do I want to write from the standpoint of the journalist who's writing the gossip? No. Do I want to write from the standpoint of the Supreme Court justice? I didn't think I could do that. I didn't sort of, I didn't feel I had the chops to write about 
someone who is a Supreme Court justice. That's a whole different headspace than I normally occupy. And I thought, this is a story for Nick, where Nick's going to come in and find out who is behind this leak and root them out. So it sort of seemed as a, it seems to have a natural fit um, for a Nick Keller book because there was a conspiracy that Nick could penetrate. And, you know, my, the thing I say about Nick Keller is that he digs up things that powerful people would rather see buried. And this was a case of that. So it fit really well. Yeah. And I love the way you described how you work through the whole point of view thing, because truly, like you said about Nelson and anyone else writing the same story, you would have written a very different story if you would have yeah. written from someone else's point of view. Right. That's how, right. How, um, your background in Russian studies at Harvard and Yale um, sure suggested that you might be on track for you know, a career um, as an international spy. Um, do, do you feel that you made the right choice working off into the land of international polar writer instead? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought about it a lot and I have thought since. I mean, I've got a friend who is the top Russia expert in the CIA. And um, I talk to him as much as he will talk to me about what he's doing on a daily basis, um, which is not that much. I mean, not that much people tell me. Um, and I, I think ultimately I was more interested in creating fiction around that world than in being a player in that world. You know, you can, you can run for president or you can write a story about a guy who runs for president. There are those of us who basically like making up stories, would rather not run for president but write that story about that guy or that woman who's running for president. So I sort of felt that my creative side would be stifled if I were to be a, an international spy or diplomat or something like that, which I did think about. Um, so instead I sort of took all this knowledge and the contacts that I made. I mean, I, I made some really good contacts in my early work. Um, who I can still call on as sources. So anyway, to me, I was more comfortable making it up. I mean, I'll just point out, we don't know for sure that you're not a New York Times best-selling pencil-loving coffee connoisseur super spy. We don't know that. <laughs> uh, it'd be a pretty good cover to be a novelist, but... Exactly. Uh, you travel anywhere, talk to anybody about anything. Anything. Uh, yeah. Joe, before we let you go, I know you can't talk about it. That's okay. Uh, any idea when readers might see the next book? Yeah, I should be done in a couple months with this draft. And I think the next book will come out next year. And then I'll probably be back on the book a year cycle. Um, the book that I'm working on now took longer than the book a year. It took, it took up, it was a harder book to write. You'll see what I mean. Um, but it's, a, it's fresh and to me exciting. And so I'll be done sometime this summer. Perfect. Well, I know we can't wait to read it. Thank yeah. you. And, and just before we let you go too, Joe, um, I believe that you might just have some singing talent as well. Am I correct? I did sing in an acapella group in college. Um, I was a bass, wow. uh, which I loved doing. And that was sort of my way of doing something in college that was completely unserious. You know, I, I sort of was doing my serious Russian studies work. And then I got to be this cut up who basically drank out of alcohol, out of loving cups at Maury's saloon on the Yale campus. So I got to sort of, and you know, the truth is I got to see a whole world as a Wiffenbooth, as a member of this group, but I never would have seen. I mean, I met some of the wealthiest people in the world we sang for the King of Jordan. We sang for a number of people in the US, the Koch family, for example, sang for them. Um, and I got to sort of, we sang with Ella Fitzgerald. So I sort of saw this world 
of celebrity and wealth and power that I think actually helped me write the Nick Keller books. So it paid off in the end. It paid off. You just never know what creative outlet is going to lead to this. That's what the best part about being an author. Yep, exactly right. Exactly right. Well, listen, Joe, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us today. It's been enlightening. And what a special moment for you and Ryan to finally meet. I love this. I love talking thrillers. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And we'll look for the next book next year. Yep. Mm -hmm.